Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex, and we're going to be talking about a form of tyranny that is not just over the mind of man, but is uh, creeping over our entire society, and that is the loss of a time-honored tradition of liberty, a, a, not even a tradition, really a mechanism of liberty. <clears throat> That's the jury. And we're going to be talking to uh, Kirsten Tynan, who is uh, with the Fully Informed Jury Association. She is trying to inform jurors what their rights are as well as their duties under the law. This is one of the most important things that uh, we have as citizens. It's, it's uh, you know, you've got the, it's been said, you've got the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. Well, we don't want to have to use the cartridge box. Uh, and the electoral box is really pretty well corrupted. And the jury box is very rarely even being used now. Uh, nearly every trial, uh, every everyone who is charged with a, uh, uh, a crime does a plea bargain rather than going for a jury trial. And so we're going to talk to uh, Kirsten, and uh, we've got her on the line right now. Kirsten, how are you doing? How are you? Thank you for joining us. Now, uh, let me tell people a little bit about you. Uh, you've, uh, it says on your bio here that... Uh, your pro-liberty activism began in school while you were studying mechanical engineering. Um, actually, uh, I'm an engineering student myself. Um, I worked for a while, but not as a mechanical engineer, but as an electrical engineer. So, um, you know, we've. Uh, what, what did you do as uh, in college when you were starting your activism? Um, I was a member of a political group, and we did things like um, we. Uh, hosted the Million Marijuana March in Tucson, and we hosted debates on campus and things like that. So, Well, it's interesting that uh, you, you bring that up because I talked this last fall to the New Jersey weed man who basically, uh, this is a fellow who had uh, marijuana, medical marijuana exemption in California, and uh, he took a lot of marijuana with him to uh, New Jersey. I think he had something like over a pound of it. It was a huge quantity, so much so that they were charging him with being a uh, dealer. And he decided that um, he, he thought he could get hung juries to let him off if he went with fully informed jury association. Of course, a lawyer won't make that kind of a plea. So he represented himself pro se. And in his first trial, he actually put up a, a placard of the New Jersey Constitution, which says that jurors have a right to judge the law as well as the facts of a case. And in that case, he got a hung jury, even though the judge told him to put it down or he's going to throw him in jail. The next case, the judge was friendly and let him keep that sign up, which is basically just a printed sign of the state constitution. And that's the first judge censored that. The second judge didn't. And in the second trial, he got off by uh, 12 to nothing. He was acquitted. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, there are many state constitutions that explicitly discuss jury nullification in one context or another. And yet in virtually no state except for New Hampshire now, um, a recent development happened last year there. But in virtually no state except New Hampshire will a judge let anyone argue jury nullification directly to the jury, even though... You know, if you look back in America's history, one of our um, Supreme Court justices was impeached in part because he was trying to deny this right of juries. That's right. That's right. I think the only uh, U.S. Supreme Court judge to ever mm -hmm. be impeached, right? That was one of the articles. Exactly. One of the articles of impeachment against the only Supreme Court justice ever impeached was that he did not in fully inform the jury. And yet what we have today, and this is why as we begin the show, we were talking about how Jimmy Carter says we're no longer a democracy. We've got a, a Senator Gordon Humphrey saying that uh, Ed Snowden has exposed uh, unconstitutional, illegitimate functions of government. And what he's concerned about is that nobody is talking about punishing the people who are doing this. And then we have Paul Craig Roberts, who is uh, one of the chief economists for Ronald Reagan, saying that our government is no longer legitimate. Because why? It doesn't follow the Constitution. And, right. and it doesn't follow the traditions that are behind all of this. It's very, very disturbing when we see... Uh, First of all, mo most people are not bothering to get jury trials because the juries have become such rubber stamps for the judges because they, they basically lie mm -hmm. to them about uh, their rights and their duties. Mm -hmm. Right. Even in New Hampshire, um, New Hampshire last year passed a statute stating that the defense must be allowed to argue jury nullification to the jury. And this was invoked in the case of Doug Darrell, um, a medical, or, or sorry, I think a religious marijuana um, user. 
and he actually won his case, but in a more recent case, that of Rich Paul, the defense argued jury nullification. The prosecutor in the closing statement acknowledged the right of jury nullification, but discouraged the jury from using it. And then the judge went ahead and used the standard uh, spiel that judges give juries, telling them that you must follow the law as I have given it to you. So that right. case is now in appeal. And I think part of the grounds for that may relate to jury instructions. Now, the, yeah, and, that, and that's the, the key thing, like you said, that even though they've had this law recently passed in New Hampshire, what that law said was that the judge could not punish anybody for bringing up jury nullification. But it didn't mandate that they actually tell them what the law is. They could actually, it, it allows judges to essentially lie to the jurors. It's not clear that it allows judges to lie to the jurors. <laughs> <laughs> I think that will be um, something that will have to be hashed out in court. Mm -hmm. But I think there is good reason to think that that is not what the law says. Right. It doesn't, if, if you read the law, it doesn't specifically state anything about what the judge is or is not to do. It's, it's specifically addressing what the defense must be permitted to do. So. Right. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But we have these, these cases in virtually all courts now where the, the judge tells them, you must do what I say. And in most cases, he'll tell them that they're not allowed to judge the law. They only have to, right. they're only allowed to look at the facts of the case. And that mm -hmm. simply is not true. That's that not true from our uh, historical background. And it mm -hmm. is not true from the letter of the law. That is actually totally incorrect what the judges tell people. Um, if you look at one of the earliest Supreme Court cases in the United States history, uh, our first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay, in fact, explicitly stated that it was a right of jurors to interpret the law as well as the facts. He, he said that judges are assumed to be the better interpreters, but it is in fact the right of juries to do their own interpretation if they see fit. And that has never been overturned. Uh, there was a court case which, uh, a Supreme Court case, which ruled that judges no longer had to inform jurors of their rights and responsibilities, but it did not overturn that right. So by simply not informing them, you know, it used to be, it used to be as commonly understood that, that jurors could refuse to enforce unjust laws as it's understood today that we're gonna get called for jury duty. It was, it was just a part of the culture. But once that was um, ruled that, that jur judges no longer had to inform jurors of that, it kind of fell out of common knowledge. And so what the Fully Informed Jury Association does is try to document and, and spread the history of that, where it comes from. It's rooted in English common law. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, that goes back most people have heard of uh, William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, a Quaker. Right. And, and mm -hmm. really, it kind of goes back to uh, his trial back in England, mm -hmm. uh, where he was arrested because, you know, they had a, a law that was, uh, uh, said that they, they, could not, they didn't have freedom of religion, basically. And so uh, they told him that they could not meet as Quakers. They violated that law as a, as a matter of conscience, and they met and the, uh, they, they actually chain locked the, uh, the church house building. So they met on the steps. They arrested him. It was a clear violation of the law, yet the jury let him go. Mm -hmm. And exactly. uh, it established habeas corpus, which says, you know, show us that, you know, we uh, actually, what, what they did was they tried, the, the judge was so outraged that he locked up the, uh, the uh, chief uh, foreman of the jury, uh, Edward Bushnell locked him up for quite a period of time, and uh, he was eventually let go by habeas corpus where people said, show us the law that the foreman broke when he allowed him to go, and they didn't right. have a law. And so and they established habeas corpus as well as the right of jury nullification mm -hmm. in that trial. Right, as well as freedom of religion and freedom yes. of speech. Yes. And, and that juror wasn't just locked up. He was denied food and water. I mean, that guy really was... Uh, Essentially, you know, it was torture of the day mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and still stuck to his guns. And so that's something that I, I wish people would really take to heart because so many times I get calls in the office from someone who will say things like, well, I didn't want to vote guilty, but everyone else was and I felt pressured. Mm -hmm. Well, buck up. You need to have a backbone. <laughs> Absolutely. We have to we have to watch each other's backs. And that was something right. that. Uh, that was explicitly said by uh, Patrick Henry and others. Right. They said that, you know, the only way this is going to work is if we 
cover each other's backs, essentially, to paraphrase what he said, if we cover each other's backs and we are, you know, in, in a trial when the government brings something against us, we talk all the time about laws that are absolutely absurd, laws that are unconstitutional, laws that are unjustifiable and unlawful, and yet where it can actually be stopped. We don't have to uh, beg for our political leaders to do some of these things. We can refuse to send our fellow citizens to jail, and yet we have the highest a, a percentage of people incarcerated of any country in the world. We have more people actually in absolute numbers than mm -hmm. China with a population many times ours. We have more people in jail than communist China does. So we basically don't have juries who are standing up who are seeing that justice is done for them. And, and as I said in a report that I did in a man on the street, I was absolutely amazed to, mm -hmm. to have people argue with me that no, 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 you have to do what the uh, judge says. You, you shouldn't seek justice for your fellow citizen. You should just do what the judge says. And in fact, I, I'm actually encouraged um, because we have recently had several cases that have been very public where jurors have in fact refused to convict. And you can see, you know, look at them, they're, the jurors aren't getting in trouble. It's very clear that they're doing it. Let's take the case of Jeff Olson in San Diego from a week or two ago. Well, let's, he, let's, let's cover that case right after we get back okay. from break because I want people to call in and uh, talk to us. We're going to clear the lines from the uh, people who have um, called to talk to the uh, deputy sheriff. But we're going to take your calls at 800-259-9231. And we especially want to talk to anybody that was uh, that's a lawyer. We won't identify who you are. You can give us a false name and tell us what you think about uh, jury nullification. And we're going to be taking those calls, and we're going to talk about some current events right after the break. You're here with Kirsten Tynan of the Fully Informed Jury Association. We'll be right back. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the InfoWars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happened. So check it out, InfoWars.com forward slash show. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Kirsten Tynan with uh, Fully Informed Jury Associations, and we're talking about how vitally important juries are to our liberties as well as to a functioning society. But, you know, during the break, I was just having a little bit of uh, the new Tangy Tangerine 2.0. It's, it's got a great peach flavor. It's really good stuff. And one of the things that's changed about this is now made with certified organic ingredients, all non-GMO ingredients. It's got over 8,000 ORAC. That's an oxygen radical absorbance capacity that looks at how, uh, how effective it is at absorbing uh, ox, uh, uh, ra uh, free radicals in your system, and uh, you can get that at 888-789-9277. So call that number. I think you'll really like Beyond Tangy Tangerine 2.0. Keeps getting better. Better tasting and uh, better stuff in it. Now, just before the break, Kirsten, you were telling us about uh, some current, you were beginning to tell us about some current cases that involved uh, fully informed juries. Yes, and I just want to mention everyone can go look on our website, FIJA.org, for more information about each of these. Um, the, the most recent one that I'm aware of is the case of Jeff Olson in San Diego, who um, was outside of Bank America on a public sidewalk and in chalk, you know, the stuff that washes off when it rains right. or someone walks on it, wrote some, you know, political statements on the sidewalk and uh, was eventually charged with 13 counts of vandalism for that, putting him at risk of a maximum penalty of $13,000 fine and 13 years in jail. This is what the city attorney thought was appropriate to charge him with and offered him a plea deal that he turned down. He wanted to take it before a jury and good for him for doing that because the jury acquitted him on all 13 charges. And it, what was especially funny about this case was that while it was going on inside the courthouse, police had chalked off an area on the sidewalk outside <laughs> where they were permitting people to chalk messages in his defense. And that was not considered vandalism. It was a clear, clear case of selective enforcement. Uh, it's just so, amazing. It's just amazing how right. the, how absurd the laws have become. You know, because we've cut ourselves loose from, you know, the Constitution, from uh, mm -hmm. basically, you know, the, these these rational boundaries. And when you don't have boundaries like that, anything can happen. I mean, that's absolutely insane. We've covered that with mm -hmm. Infowars. That's, that's truly amazing. The key thing being that he went to a jury trial because, you mm -hmm. know, when you've got really absurd laws like that, you need to go before a jury. But mm -hmm. quite often, 
uh, jurors don't really understand what their rights are. So that's what you're trying to do. And, and what do you do with FIJA to educate people? I know that whenever they buy anything from InfoWars, we always have these little pocket constitutions that we put in every order. And part of that is not just the constitution, but it mm -hmm. talks in that uh, little in that little booklet that we put in there, it talks a lot about mm -hmm. juries and the importance of juries and, and uh, your right to judge the law mm -hmm. as well as the facts of the case. Exactly. Well, we publish a, a variety of literature and anyone can request a free jury power information kit from us by calling us at 1-800-T-E-L-J-U-R-Y, 1-800-TELL-JURY. And that same literature that you'll receive in there, we have activists across the country distributing at courthouses, at festivals, at community meetings. We have people who speak across the country, do all sorts of outreach. Um, and so uh, we also we also celebrate uh, since you mentioned the William Penn case um, this we're getting ready for September 5th, which is Jury Rights Day in commemoration of that case. And on Jury Rights Day, we have people out all across the country doing all kinds of community events. We have banners that uh, people will, will hold outside. We've had people march in parades with our banners and um, give out information at tables at county fairs around that time because it's labor around Labor Day. So um, we have a lot of different ways and we invite everyone to visit us at Fiji.org to find out how they can get involved and volunteer if they'd be interested. That's great. And, yeah, it's, it really is an educational effort at this point because people have been so hoodwinked and lied to about their rights. It's one of the reasons this is the uh, citizen's rule book that we uh, put in every order that we uh, send out. And if you look at this right at the very front of it, even before it gets into the uh, Constitution, it talks about jury rights. The jury has a right to judge both the law as well as the facts of the case and controversy. That's from our first Chief Justice, John Jay. Uh, over and over again, as you mentioned, it's, it's a tradition mm -hmm. that has been reinforced by chief justices, by history, by mm -hmm. the law itself. Many state constitutions have that written into the law. Let's take some calls uh, from people about this issue. Uh, we've got Tyler in Oklahoma. Tyler, what's your question? Hello? Yes. What's your question, Tyler? Um, I, it was more of a suggestion. Um, you know, you're talking about the importance of a jury trial. Well, it goes to, you know, traffic. Um, court, especially here in Oklahoma, it, it's a criminal offense, and it, they changed the Sixth Amendment into where unless there's six months in prison or fifteen hundred dollars in fines, you don't have the right to a trial by jury. Wow! Therefore, it becomes a bench trial, and so you don't have a chance to win in a bench trial because the state is prosecuting you, the state is testifying against you, and the state is judging you. Um, my suggestion would be us try to get the Sixth Amendment changed back. Because hang on, hang on, we'll get to you right after the break. We'll be right back. We're taking calls. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because Today, we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter. And in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex today. And our guest is Kirsten Tynan. And we're talking about juries, about their rights and their duties. You know, juries are there to watch your back, and if you're ever fortunate enough to be on a jury, you need to watch the other person's back. You need to make sure that the laws are really just laws, that they're constitutional laws and that they're also just laws, and that's what juries are there for. Now, we were just talking on the, we had a caller on the line, Tyler from Oklahoma, and he was telling us, uh, Tyler, you were telling us that they have basically done away with juries in Oklahoma unless it's uh, over a certain amount of money, is that correct? Uh, the Sixth Amendment was changed, I believe it's everywhere, um, is that unless there's six months in prison or $1,500 in fines, you don't have a right to a trial by jury. So therefore, in traffic violations, you know, 
they'll give you a $250 ticket and it doesn't make sense to go hire an attorney for a thousand to $1,500 to represent you. So of course you're just going to plead guilty and it's just a credit a monopoly and a sheep line. That's right. Um, That's right. my issue is, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, my issue is, is I think if we get the sixth amendment change to where we don't have that restriction and we would have juries, um, you know, we would be able to have the opportunity to present cases such as, you know, the right to travel. There's been several U.S. Supreme Court cases saying that you have the right to travel. And, you know, of course, you're never going to win that type of case in mm -hmm. a bench trial. So if you had a jury actually reading cases such as the, the right of a citizen to travel upon public highways and to transport his property thereon either by carriage or by automobile, automobile is not a mere privilege, which a city may prohibit, permit at will, but a common law right, which he has under the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, Thompson versus Smith, if they were to read stuff like that, they would wake up and realize that the government has conditioned us, starting off with such things as driver's license, marriage license, hunting license. Well, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, broader, it's broader than that, Tyler, because, you know, we have situations like uh, the IRS has their own tax court, right, which is an administrative court. It's not really a uh, constitutional court. You've got the EPA has its own court. So in many of these cases, you have these created entities that uh, write their own law as regulators. They enforce their own law, and they judge with a panel, of, like you said, a bench trial without juries. They judge whether or not you're in violation of that law. What do you think about that, Kirsten? Well, I have good news. The Sixth Amendment has not been changed. The mm -hmm. bad news is that it is being disregarded. So changing it back is not going to help because it hasn't been changed in the first place. It still states right. that in all criminal prosecutions, you have the right to trial by jury. That's right. It's simply it's simply being ignored. That's right. And, and if, they, if they have a law that says, uh, well, the Sixth Amendment doesn't apply uh, unless it's over a certain amount, that has mm -hmm. no more effect than if they say, well, if you're within 100 uh, miles of the border, mm -hmm. that's a Constitution-free zone. I mean, mm -hmm. they don't have the authority, and, and neither right. actually does the Supreme Court have the authority to, them, to amend mm -hmm. the Constitution. There's a very specific process right. for where the uh, Constitution is amended, and it isn't mm -hmm. done by fiat of some state right. legislature or even by the Congress. Mm -hmm. And one, one tactic that I want to mention that is similar to what the caller was uh, talking about is that in the state of Oregon, um, there is a situation that I became aware of last year where several, I mean, dozens and dozens of Occupy protesters have been arrested and treated like criminals. They were handcuffed. They were taken to jail. They were held. Then once they were, once the public spectacle was over and it became clear that that, that was going to be a big problem in the court system, the district attorney decided to drop the charges to the level of essentially a traffic ticket. And um, so they started getting bench trials for, for things for which they had been treated as criminals. Well, a non-related case was going through the appeals court in Oregon at the time, um, and it was ruled that these defendants could not, it, you couldn't do this bait and switch on these defendants. They were to be given the right to trial by jury. And it, last I checked, that's still uh, being argued, but um, it was a question of whether or not they were going to get jury trials, whether or not all the charges were just going to be dropped because it was clogging the courts, or whether um, the district attorney, I guess, in that case, was going to appeal the charges. So, But it's a very common tactic that they will treat you as a criminal when they're arresting you, when they're jailing you before you, ha you get to court. But once you get to court, they want to change the rules so it's more favorable for them in court. Well, you know, and, and, and as people are listening to this, they're thinking maybe, well, you know, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I would never do anything to offend mm -hmm. the government or whatever. Let's remind people that it wasn't, uh, it was just a couple of months ago that we had uh, a fellow on a beach uh, release uh, three or four heart-shaped balloons uh, as part of a uh, anniversary or proposal or something mm -hmm. like that. And he was charged with multiple felonies mm -hmm. because each release of a balloon was considered to be mm -hmm. a felony. Right. You never know when you're going to be swooped up by the police state that's here. And mm -hmm. the, there's the article right there we've got up there. Um, and let man me, faces let's... five years in prison for releasing balloons on the beach as a romantic gesture. You never know when you're going to be swept up by these insane laws. And you need a jury of people who have mm -hmm. a mind and a backbone to stand up for you against these ridiculous laws. And you need to stand up for other people as well. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what's going on there. We are seeing a huge trend in this country of prosecutors overcharging people, mm -hmm. just increasingly excessively because what they want to they don't want a jury trial they don't want you to go to a jury trial they want you to take a plea deal so they will charge you with something <clears throat> 
that is ex- ridiculously excessive. And then they will offer you the carrot of you can get off with a slap on the wrist kind of thing. And what I like to tell people is that if the, if the prosecutor is willing to settle for, I don't know, a fine or community service, but if you go to jury trial, they want to nail you for 80 years, and that is an <laughs> actual case, yeah. then what is the, what is the math there? The math is that your right to trial by jury, they're charging you 80 years of your life to exercise that. That's what they're doing. Yeah. The yeah. difference between what they're willing to settle for in court and what they're willing to settle for if you simply knuckle under to petty authority, that is your the price you're paying for a jury trial. And, and that is disrespecting our right to jury trial. It's using it against us if we exercise it. You're better off to represent yourself pro se than to give in to that kind of stuff like that. I mean, you know, and go for a, a uh, a uh, fully informed jury plea, just like uh, the New Jersey weed man said. You know, in that first trial where he got over half of the jurors to uh, let him go, he said he put up the the law from the New Jersey Constitution, even though the judge threatened him and made him take it down right away, threatened him uh, with contempt and was going to throw him in uh, jail. He said it was too late. The information was already out there. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that this uh, citizen's rule book says, it says the only power the judge has over the jury is their ignorance. Mm-hmm. That's what we're trying to cure right. here with a fully informed jury right. association. We're trying to inform people about what their rights and their duties are right. as jurors. We've got a, a caller here, Cletus in California. Cletus, do you have a question for us? Hello, Cletus. Are you there? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, Clay in, in North Carolina. Hi, David. Hi, Kirsten. Hi. Hi. What's your question, Clay? Uh, boy, what you folks are saying here, it just... There's so many things that's running through my mind. The main thing, though, that uh, the comment I had was uh, the uh, emphasis also needs to be just as much on grand juries as pettit juries. Mm-hmm. Uh, this the way we uh, fight over zealous prosecutors to to nail mm-hmm. on what you were just talking about. Right, and we actually do deal with grand juries as well. I just got an email last night from someone who is actually on a grand jury asking for information on what grand juries are all about. He said, um, it seems like all we're doing is rubber stamping what the prosecution hands us, and I'm not sure that's what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, hopefully we will get him straightened out. But in fact, grand juries are meant to be a barrier between uh, government and the defendant. It's there. It's supposed to be a hurdle that they have to that they have to overcome in order to charge someone. It's not supposed to be this rubber stamp um, ham sandwich situation that we're all so familiar with. Yeah, unfortunately, we're seeing that rubber stamp happen at all levels. Uh, you know, it, mm-hmm. it's it's just uh, the grand jury is particularly notable about that. Uh, Maureen in Virginia, Maureen, have you got a question for us? Actually, what you were just talking about. When I was in Charleston, South Carolina, I was I found out who the chairman of the grand jury was. I had to sneak into the grand jury behind the prosecutor's back. And when I was there, I saw a cop come in and hand the woman in charge two stacks. One, he said, true bill this stack. The other one, he said, no bill this stack. And she came over to me. She says, I'll just be a few minutes. And I'm thinking, yeah, right, it's going to take hours. But within a couple minutes, she brought them out. True bill this stack, no bill this stack. They don't even have five not even reading them. to read any of them. But that's not why I called. I <laughs> called because, unfortunately, I called because I wanted to know if both the sheriff and the prosecutor are in, involved in criminal activity. How in the world can you get that stopped with a jury, especially when... The grand jury thing is a scam, and the people basically have to come in. If they don't come in to be on the grand jury, they are arrested, and they have to stay there until they true bill or no bill the stack, and they're not allowed to investigate anything. How do you get around that? Mm-hmm. That's a pretty complex question. Um, there's not much that a jury can do in, in terms of getting rid of a sheriff or a judge who is corrupt if that if that doesn't end up in court. That's not just not something that a jury can do. But what a jury can do is refuse to check their conscience at the courthouse door and refuse to enforce the things that, that such a, a, a government agent as a, a corrupt judge or a corrupt sheriff is trying to push. Simply vote not guilty. And what I encourage people to do is to keep their mouth shut 
about jury nullification yes. once they get to the courthouse. Because if it becomes clear at any point that you are aware of your full authority as a juror to refuse to enforce unjust laws, you can be excluded during voir dire, or you can even be removed during deliberations. Absolutely. What you cannot be what you cannot be removed from a jury for is for expressing doubt about a juror's guilt. So do I suggest not trying to convince anyone else on the jury to nullify. Simply vote not guilty. Um, stick to your not guilty vote. Hang the jury if you have to. A hung jury is okay. It's much better for a defendant to have a hung jury than to have a guilty vote against them that they have to appeal. Uh, so what I tell people is show up, get on the jury, stand up for what is right, and then shut up. Just don't discuss jury nullification unless you're you're sure, like in, in New Hampshire, that's a, a different situation. If, if you're sure that everyone else is kind of on board with that already, that's that's one thing. But don't try and do a 12 angry men scenario where you're the one lone juror convincing everyone else that jury nullification is the way to go. Because as uh, exciting and dramatic as that seems, it's not likely to play out that way in real and, life. And that's a real important point to make there, Chris. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because... At any point, you know, you can get, uh, you come in there as a juror, the uh, defense or, or the prosecutor can throw you out for any reason. And uh, the judge can take you off if you're in, in jury deliberations and you start talking about jury nullification. He can remove you at that point, you know, because they always mm -hmm. have jurors and they always have alternate jurors. So the point that Kristen just made is very, very important. Inform yourself, inform other people outside of the trial. But once you're there in a courtroom situation, Keep your mouth shut about jury nullification. Focus on it. Talk about your objections, you know, to what's going on. Even if it was clear that uh, the person violated the law, but like it was in the case of the New Jersey weed man, uh, it's clear that he violated the law. There was no question about that. And he didn't deny that he had uh, that quantity of marijuana with him. But he was, he was made that case specifically about jury nullification. But once you're there... Even if you're going to nullify it because you disagree with the law, you can still say that you're, you find issues with uh, the court's case and you can mm -hmm. hang the jury. If you hang tough, eventually they'll have to just declare mm -hmm. that it's a hung jury and go. But if you tell people that you're there to nullify the law, they're going to remove you in most cases. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Bill in California. Bill, you have a question? Happy to see you there. It's nice to have a, a sane man at the microphone. <laughs> a little humor here. We have a... Uh, the district attorney who's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and he arrested a woman for passing out FIJA information on the courthouse steps. He called it jury tampering. Mm -hmm. Well, then he hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed, and about six months later, it finally dawns on him that the only way to prosecute this case is to show the jury the literature she was passing out. <laughs> And <laughs> as we catch 22, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing I'll say about that is that um, people are starting to figure out that um, if they go for a bench trial of some sort, then they can get around the jury in that case. But it is, in fact, not jury tampering to hand out our literature. Our literature discusses no cases. We as an organization advocate neither for nor against any case in progress. We are simply doing general juror education outreach. And so what we encourage activists to do to try and help protect themselves from these inaccurate kinds of charges is not to not to do this in conjunction with any sort of um, court uh, case advocacy. Just do it as a, a standalone effort. And if there is a, a case that is of particular interest in the, the community at the time, I suggest going out a few weeks in advance and go out every Monday or you know whatever once a week in advance to establish yourself as part of the landscape and establish that you are not there advocating for or against that case. You're simply doing general juror education outreach. But um, do be aware that in some cases, if, if there's a court, uh, uh, an order from the court or something to, of that nature, um, they may, um, harass you in a way that does not get you before a jury so that's right yeah you know julian heikland that i talked to he he has a video of uh some officers coming out of a court and uh trying to entrap him by saying you know tell me what you're doing here why are you doing this and you know and he basically handed him the literature and said here read it for yourself it speaks for itself all he would say is here it speaks for itself you're safe as long as you do that they can't charge you with uh jury tampering if you're handing out 
general literature talking about the rights of jurors and not specifically mentioning well, any case. <laughs> that's, right? that's semi true. They can <laughs> charge you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They can charge you with <laughs> anything, but then they but have it's to. It's going to be hard to make it stick. Exactly. Then they have to say why. They, <laughs> they have right. to show, like the caller but, said. Yeah. The, that's the great. thing is, they're certainly not supposed <laughs> to charge you. Uh, but what, you know, what the, what following the law is apparently a very challenging thing for law enforcement officers. Well, I mean, they're still, <laughs> they're still charging people about for videotaping officers in public, right, even though exactly. there's been court case after court case after court right. case and it's people well keep winning judgments. Yeah. They still, they still do it. So, uh, yes. yeah, they, they can do anything they want, but at some point, right. and that's what we're talking about. At some point, if the jurors are informed, they're going to stand behind you. Mark in Florida, do you have a question for Kirsten? Oh, yeah, yes, I do. And I'd like to, to tag along on the last caller. Uh, you can file a bar grievance against every attorney. Bar grievance not nettle help. Eddie Craig was on the radio show. Uh, uh, you can get to the grand jury and file a complaint just like the prosecutor would. Learn how to, to do the paperwork. A gentleman was jailed in Florida for handing out FIJA. And I was wondering if FIJA has a... Uh, habeas corpus template or something to help get these people out of jail because they are falsely accused, falsely charged, and once they can get out, then they can file the complaints against the, the officers that are locking them up. Hang on, we're going to get the, the answer for that question. Hang on right after the break and Kirsten Tynan from Fiji is going to tell us about that right after the break. So stay tuned and find out the answer. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex, and our guest today is Kirsten Tynan with the Fully Informed Jury Association. We're talking about your rights and your duties as a juror. And uh, just as we got Doctor Who there, yes, we've taken some time travel here. We've also, we've talked about the tradition of fully informed juries as well as the legal rights of fully informed jurors. And whenever you order anything from InfoWarsStore.com, you're going to get one of these citizen rule books. And it is not just a citizen rule book of the Constitution. It actually says it's got the Bill of Rights and a jury handbook. And I like this little tag here that's on the cover. It says, a fireworks are in the document. That's right. They're not just something we shoot off on the 4th of July. And inside there, you're going to find one of the first things you come across is about jurors. And it says the only power the judge has over the jury is their ignorance. And we're trying to end that ignorance by informing people of what their rights and duties are. And we've got Kirsten Tynan, as I mentioned, from Fija.org on the line. And we just had a caller ask you about if you're doing a literature handout on the courthouse steps and uh, they decide to unlawfully charge you, uh, do you have an information packet that helps with that? We actually have um, guidelines for activists to avoid getting arrested in the first place. Um, That's even we, better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We we don't want anyone getting arrested. That plays right into the hands of the government. Um, it's a script that's been written by the government, and they know how to act that out very well. So in the in the case in Florida where there was a, a, an order um, not to hand out a certain literature, we actually were in the process of challenging that civilly when it was violated, and unfortunately. Um, once someone got arrested and it was uh, reported in the news that they were associated with us, um, our court challenge was thrown out of court, which was unfortunate. We had pro bono representation from the ACLU and from the Walters First Amendment Law Group down in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. But we have elsewhere in Florida been very successful. Um, we had an activist who did indeed assert his rights and go through the process without getting arrested to insist upon those rights. And there's now a memo on our website from David B. Eddy, administrative judge of the Circuit Court, Fifth Judicial Circuit, State of Florida, that states, and I quote, based on principles of free speech, I believe that whoever is distributing the hands out, handouts in question has a right to do so. Accordingly, I see no reason why the handouts must be excluded from the jury assembly room. I believe we may trust jurors to follow the law as instructed by the judge. Right. So 
this this person obviously disagrees with jury nullification but he is he has stated it, it's perfectly you know within our rights to distribute that and without anyone getting arrested we have a memo from this judge in that district so well that's great um, we, you know that's that's the important thing is that you get the word out that we establish a legal precedence that we don't have the uh, bad publicity that mm -hmm. somebody got arrested for exercising their constitutional rights but again mm -hmm. i would remind people that you know uh, just as uh, we occasionally have police jurisdictions where they arrest mm -hmm. people for videotaping, that is your right. And if you don't exercise mm -hmm. your rights, you will lose them right. through, uh, through apathy, through non-use. And so exactly. it is important that you stand up even though you may, mm -hmm. there may be some consequences for it, but it is right. not illegal. Right. And you definitely can insist upon your rights in a way that is not going to put you as at, at as much risk as in, in the case where the arrest happened in Florida. That individual didn't even get a jury trial. That is a huge risk. He not only lost his freedom for that amount of time, but he lost income, you know, and all of that. Yeah. Um, whereas, you well, know, you know he's, the, uh, Kirsten, just before we had you, we had Stan Linick who is the uh, Constitutional Sheriffs and Police Off Peace Officers Association uh, Deputy Sheriff of the Year. And one of the things he said was, you know, it's the way you interact with the police. Sometimes you can defuse a confrontational issue like that just by being wise about what you say. And that's where your materials that you have at FIJA come in. They not only educate people, but they show them how to do it. We're out of time. Thank you so much for talking to us and explaining that to us. And uh, we want to keep up on this, and it's an information war. We want to inform people of what their rights and their duties are. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kirsten Tynan. Thank you for having me. Now you can watch the InfoWars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show.